Hey guys, Brent Holt, Build Show, talking today about the chair rail. What height it should be, when you should use it, where you should use it, why you shouldn't measure the back of a chair to determine its height, and it is never 36 inches. Today on the Build Show. So we're talking about chair rails today, and right now it's never 36. Why do I say that? Well, remember, okay, that the whole classical system of moldings, where we get the base, where we get the crown, where we get the picture rail, okay, all of those things come from this classical system, this organization, and the chair rail is typically aligned with the pedestal of this classical system, as you see in this slide. Guys, so, I understand the confusion with this whole deal because it's called the chair rail, and so naturally it has to align with a chair in the room, right? Well, not true. Based on the classical system, remember the classical system defines how moldings get put into a room. The height of the base, the size of the crown, all those things come from the classical system. And in that classical system, the chair rail was not called a chair rail. It was called a surbase or a dado. It's called a wainscot cap. There's a lot of different words. And one of the other things that adds to the confusion is during different architectural traditions, you'll see the chair rail and, and wainscoting used differently. We're going to get into all that and talk about it. Now, when I've talked about chair rails before, and I wrote an article for Gary Katz 10 years ago that still gets replies, the misused and confused chair rail, right? And the number one thing I got back from guys is, it's always 36, it's, I've always put it at 36, and therefore it is 36. Or they say, I would never do that, I measure the chair in the room and determine the height of the chair rail. So let's dispel the chair rail height issue right now. So we've got three chairs here, right? We've got a modern chair from the 50s. We've got a, a Windsor copy and a cheap dining room chair, right? Notice the height of these backs of the chairs, okay, are 32 inches, 42 inches, 36 inches, right? Assuming that the chair is gonna be the thing that determines the chair rail is silly. In fact, in my career, I've never, Ask the client, uh, can I see your chair so I can measure the back of it, right? You don't do that, right? Second, notice that on this chair here, right, that just because the chair, back of the chair rail, doesn't mean the chair rail can go here, because I can still hit that chair rail, still be a quarter of an inch off the wall, even though the chair rail is hitting there. So using the chair to determine the height of the chair rail is just silliness. And if you try to do that or try to talk your customer into it, you're just gonna be showing that you really don't understand where it should go. The second thing that's hard about chair rails is where they go, okay? And so there's a whole tradition, uh, looking back historically, that chair rails, as we're talking about them today, as they would go in a hall or a formal room, were never determined or never followed the rules in a functional space. So in a kitchen, right, and historically in a kitchen, because it was a servant's area, because they were, you know, splashing blood on the walls and cutting chickens and doing all the kinds of crazy things they were doing, right? You had a tall wainscot to protect the walls from, you know, dirt and debris, okay? So bathrooms are the same thing. If you look at bathrooms historically, oftentimes because of water splashing and other things, that chair rail is also gonna be higher. So in a functional space, if you have to put a chair rail, for instance, in a kitchen, if you have an open living room and you're trying to unify the room, and we'll talk more about that when we look at some examples going forward, but one of the things a chair rail does is unify a space. And sometimes in an open floor plan house, it's very difficult to put a chair rail at the proper height, right? Because you've got a countertop at 36, right? And I'm saying that chair rail shouldn't be 36, so what do you do? And I get that email quite a bit, how do I handle a kitchen? It's a functional space, you're really not treating it the same way. And really understanding, right, the use of these spaces is part of the trick to using the chair rail at the proper height. The third thing that, that kind of confuses the chair rail is this idea of architectural traditions, right? In the arts and crafts period, actually even going back farther, in the Tudor period, they oftentimes panelized their walls with this wood wainscot, lack of a better word, wood paneling that went up three quarters of the height of the room, right? That they left a little space at the top. Sometimes there's a plate rail at the top. And certainly this happens again in the arts and crafts tradition. 
in the arts and crafts, they pick up some of that English flavor and you have a really high paneled wall. Well, I wouldn't consider that a wainscot, right? I wouldn't consider that something that's gonna determine, you know, this height in these proper spaces. And so remember that part of understanding how to use the chair rail in the room is understanding what architectural tradition in you're in. If you've got an arts and crafts house, I probably wouldn't be doing a classical chair rail in a classical height because it's not part of the tradition. All right, so some rules of thumb, right? What height should my chair rail be? Notice in this picture that this chair rail, if that door handle's at 36, is probably at, you know, 38, almost 40, right? A really high chair rail. And also notice that the height of that ceiling, if it's a 6A door, is probably only eight feet. So they've almost cut that room in half with the chair rail. Now, I said it, chair rail's almost never 36. Why do I say that? Part of what a low chair rail does is it creates this height and this length to the room. It makes the room feel taller. Ironically, some people will put the chair rail in, realize it doesn't make the room feel taller when we put stripes on the walls. I've seen that before. Lowering the chair rail is this visual cue of height that goes forward. So this, this was a paneled wall we made for a client. This was a sample, 11 feet tall, right? My chair rail is you know, right at 31, right? A quick rule of thumb is, is that the chair rail size and the chair rail location is gonna change as the room size changes. Now, when I showed you in the classical videos these, these rooms, and basically I've got the classical system on an eight foot, nine foot, and 10 foot ceiling. A really quick rule of thumb is that the chair rail height is one fifth the height of the room, okay? Now, I'm sure some of you guys are already doing the math and figuring out that an eight foot room means that my chair rail's at 20 inches, right? Yikes, that's kind of low, right? How can I ever put a chair rail in at 20 inches? I'm not saying to do that, but as you calculate and you look around your spaces and you're trying to unify the space, that's a quick rule of thumb, okay? It's not a third, it's not a half, right? About a fifth, okay? Sometimes people do a quarter, somewhere in that range. Now, what that means is, is that for this 10 foot tall room, I've got a two, 25, 24, 25 inch high chair rail. My general rule of thumb is, is that 28 to 32 inches is really a nice height, okay? 36 is too much, uh, 24 is probably too low, so that 28 to 32 is really nice. So what a molding should be doing, what moldings in general should be doing is helping to communicate what's going on in a space, helping to unify a space. So we worked on this house, which is a you know colonial revival house that had a 1960s, 1970s edition on the back. Now, what happened is, is we, as we were remodeling this space and putting it all back together, we had a very traditional house tied to a very modern house. How do we unify that space? How do we bring it together? Well, what we did was, and the whole back was just this big wall of glass. What we did was we started with this mantle, right? We started with this, this beautiful mantle from Winter Tour. And one of the tricks we picked up by looking at historic spaces was that the top of the wainscot cap was painted black. Uh, in some cases, it was like a mahogany cap, a stain grade cap, but a really unique feature that then trailed around this whole space. Now, we did a couple things. One, we established hierarchy, okay, in this space by having some rooms more important than others. We had a pedestal, okay, and a wainscot cap. In some cases, we just had a chair rail that ran through. In some cases, we had a full paneled wainscot below. Now, as you moved around these spaces, and especially in this back hall, we had a very modern space, and all glass, terrazzo floor, and what we did was we introduced the chair rail going through there, redid the windows on the back side, so it too had a chair rail going through it, still allowed a ton of natural light, but it became a unifying piece, right? And so even in the master suite, where we had this kind of back window. And there's an example of taking a chair rail and pulling two separate houses really together, uh, outside in, pulling it all together so it looks beautiful. So those are the quick rules on the chair rail, right? It's never 36 inches. Don't measure the back of a chair. Remember the architectural traditions, all great things to remember. Use it to unify the space. Follow me on Instagram and Facebook, Hull Millwork, Hull Homes. Sign up for the newsletter. I'm Brent Hull. Thanks for watching.